reshoring, industrial real estate, oil and gas, and of course, the housing market. These are just some of the topics we'll discuss today on The Real Wealth Show. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks for joining me here. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Hey there, welcome back to our YouTube channel. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a thumbs up and uh, hit that subscribe button. It really makes a difference. Our guest today, Ben Frazier, is the Chief Investment Officer at Aspen Funds, where they're invested in various asset classes, including oil wells, industrial and multifamily real estate, and other alternative investments. Prior to joining Aspen, Ben served as a commercial lender at First Business Bank and as a commercial underwriter at Cross First Bank. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show to talk about economic trends that affect these kinds of alternative investments. Ben, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so we have been on, well, I was on a panel with your dad, not you, right? Was I ever on a panel with you? No, I think it was, yeah, my dad, yep. Okay, we we did the debate at the best ever. And, you know, they, at that conference, they just sort of give you a topic and you have to argue it, whether you believe right. it or not. Right, you pick which side you're on. <laughs> <laughs> so your dad's like, oh boy, I'm going to have a tough one on this. But uh, you guys are, you have a family owned company, is that right? Yeah. So we actually have four partners. Um, My dad and I are two of the partners. So it's family plus. (laughs) Okay. And you're mostly invested in industrial and oil and gas. And what are your other asset classes? Yeah, we have a a variety. So we have a lot of real estate. So we have a lot of uh, holdings in multifamily, um, storage, retail. But industrial is probably our biggest... um, real estate vertical that we're uh, most bullish on right now. And then we, we actually are, are where we started over 11 years ago was in credit uh, uh, deals. So we started a mortgage note fund uh, coming out of the, the GFC um, about 11 years ago. And we also have kind of commercial credit, uh, preferred equity type funds as well. So um, then, yeah, and oil and gas investing is another vertical for us. So kind of a little bit of everything. Yeah. So when people talk about real estate and oftentimes in the headlines, they just lump it together like all real estate this is the same and that it couldn't be more opposite. Different asset classes in real estate perform differently during different market cycles, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're you're spot on there. You know, you see the headlines of, oh, real estate values are down 30% and it's uh, it it's annoying because it's you know, what, what are you measuring? You know, there's, there's yeah. one, not one real estate market. There's, you know, hundreds of real estate markets, right? And are you looking at, you know, which part of the country and which sub markets are you uh, bringing into that? Cause they all perform differently, right? They have different drivers of, of uh, what's, you know, growing or, you know, not growing in different areas. And then you have different asset classes. So when, when people say, you know, real estate's commercial real estate is not doing well, or it's, you know, headed for some pretty big, uh, you know, challenges, most people are referring to office, right? And so <laughs> office is, um, a very, very large real estate asset class. I believe it's the largest or the second largest of any commercial real estate. And it's pretty obvious. Most people understand why it's uh, struggling because, you know, in this kind of post COVID world and uh, the work from home, the hybrid workforce uh, is really shifting the, uh, the fundamental demand drivers of that asset class. And so, yeah, that, that is a challenge, but other asset classes, it's a very different story, right? There's some some bumps in different markets for multifamily, but we're actually seeing the opposite in the Midwest. I'm here in Kansas City, and in Kansas City, we're actually expecting six percent rent growth in 2024, right? <laughs> and so that's that's not you know dropping uh, you know rent deceleration. Um, and then yeah, industrial is a completely different set of demand drivers, and the reason we're bullish on that is. Um, the reshoring initiatives that have been happening over the past several years of bringing manufacturing back to the U S of uh, rebuilding supply chains to be less dependent on overseas um, uh, supply chains. And so there's other things that are, you know, driving 
demand and fundamentals in every asset class. Yeah. So bottom line, be careful when you see headlines that say real estate's in trouble or, you know, values are down 60% or whatever they say, these dramatic headlines, because they may be just referring to office, which is true. That's a very challenged uh, asset class right now. Um, so when you say that there's this reshoring happening, we learned a lot over COVID, right? That we probably shouldn't be so dependent on other countries for the really important things that we need. Where are some of the areas in the country where that's happening the most? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something that uh, was already kind of starting to happen pre-COVID, but COVID accelerated all these things. Like it did in yeah. a lot of areas, right? Like the work from home with office, like that was kind of starting to happen. And then boom, it just, you know, accelerated <laughs> that by a decade or so. It's very similar because what happened in, and really when I was in school and business school and um, you know, you're learning all about globalization, you're learning about just in time inventory systems. And the idea is, you know, as we become a more interconnected globe and we can outsource manufacturing um, to you know cheaper parts of the of the world that have cheaper labor um, we can create efficiencies we can create lower costs for consumers and then we can create these supply chains that you know you press a button on Amazon and you know it gets notified someone in China and then they you know are shipping all these things. Um, across the U.S. and it goes through, you know, maybe ten or fifteen points of uh, the supply chain to get to your door, right? And so we we've we've globalized in a lot of ways, but what's really happened, I think, what COVID exposed was in a lot of ways we over globalized. There became an over reliance on um, these supply chains to where we just took for granted that we push that button, it shows up. Well, we all felt <laughs> the impact of when you push the button and we all get the emails of, Hey, due to supply chain issues, this is being delayed. Right. Mm-hmm. And we saw that over and over and over again. So what's happened is it's really caused the whole industry to reevaluate um, how they want to uh, one deal with inventory. Because the idea was if we have inventory held overseas, um, then it's cheaper over there and we can just get it whenever we need it. But what if there's trade restrictions? What if there's, you know, you know, COVID is impacting how things move and, and how quickly they move. Um, and so, you know, example of this is Ford, uh, the manufacturing company, uh, auto manufacturer, they were building their trucks uh, during COVID and there was a huge demand because everyone's getting the stimulus money and they want to go get the brand new truck. Well, they had at one point uh, over $3 billion of inventory sitting on lots that they could not sell because they didn't have the computer chips to actually make the whole car work. And, wow. you know, these small com- uh, computer chips from, a, you know, they're very critical. And from the overall cost of manufacturing, it's a very, very small cost, but it's so important to actually delivering an, a, a usable end product. And so that's a case across the board where a lot of these manufacturers are thinking, hey, maybe it's a little more expensive to uh, have more inventory in the U.S. or actually bring the manufacturing of that component back to the U.S. But it's so important in the delivery of my completed end product that I'd, I, I'd rather pay a little bit more to have the insurance against a broken supply chain. That's one element of it. The other element is over the past several decades, supply costs, uh, sorry, uh, labor costs um, in other countries has skyrocketed. So uh, we've actually seen a 15x, 15 times increase in wages in China over the past two decades. So there's been a massive inflationary uh, impact on wages. And so it's, if you take into account, Wages, shipping, logistics, tariffs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually pff, not that much more expensive to, to manufacture in the U.S. for even non-critical components, right? And so there's a lot of what's called reshoring, nearshoring. So going to uh, Mexico, there's a lot of activity going to Mexico. And so to your, your end question of, you know, where is this kind of happening? What's, uh, how is it impacting the U.S. markets? Um, it's, it's shifted a lot away from the coast and the coasts are still active, right? But those are generally from the international trade, but there's been a lot happening with Mexico. Um, and then also the distribution networks in kind of the kind of heartland where, you know, we're here in the Midwest, 
um, uh, distribution is a big, big deal. And so a lot of, um, a lot of these companies are making decisions, uh, one to go find strong labor forces, uh, which is a lot of times in the, uh, the Midwest. Um, and then also strong distribution networks to be able to get those products out to the, uh, the end user in an efficient, cost effective way. So those are the things that are kind of reshaping the whole landscape. Um, and industrial, it's interesting if, if you look at most, uh, estimates of, you know, values, uh, being impacted from interest rates increasing. Obviously we talked about office. Those, Values have dropped a lot. I mean, let's just be honest about it. Um, you know, multifamily has been hit, especially in certain markets of, of oversupply. Uh, and you look at industrial, it's, it's actually the sector of real estate that has been least impacted from a value standpoint of any other real estate uh, asset class. And so values are still very, very strong because there's low vacancy um, and the absorption continues to be very, very strong of all the new supply that's being brought on because of these demand drivers. And so... For a lot of those reasons, that that's why we're um, you know playing a lot in that that sector. Yeah. Okay. And and specifically, so are you saying the the areas of America that border Mexico would be um, growing at this time, or are yeah, there definitely? Yeah. yeah, a lot of those uh, kind of Southwest states and areas. Um, kind of Southwest Texas is on fire right now. So you know, th- those are a lot of kind of gateway markets uh that trade a lot with mexico and come across but it's it's also just beyond that as well right there's mm-hmm. uh what we're looking for is really undersupplied markets with strong labor forces because that's really what's driving a lot of the decision making of these yeah. companies absolutely that's what that's what we look for too but more in the uh, residential sector but right. it, it all works together right if there's jobs coming to a certain area, you're going to need storage, you're going to need industrial, you're going to need some multifamily and, and a one to four unit. So paying attention to where this growth is happening is the key to being successful, really in any business. Um, we I just got back from San Antonio and was kind of curious what's driving their growth. And and they did say a lot of what you just said. Yeah. So we're, we're very bullish. San Antonio there. is a hot market for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, um, that with a wasn't there going to be a freeway built or something that connected Mexico to uh, Canada that would go right through where you are? <laughs> Did that ever happen? Yeah, I don't think that ever happened. I think it was a okay. railway. I think that got kiboshed uh, with the okay. current um, uh, yeah administration. But it's it's something that I think could be very beneficial. So hopefully, at some point, it gets it gets passed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, you and your dad are very focused on seeing the uh, the big picture, right? Where the economy is headed. Because again, this plays such a big part in whatever you're investing in. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you seeing over the next couple of years? You know, if we were to really pull back, because you're a fund manager, I'm a fund manager. You can't think about just tomorrow, or what's going to happen at the end of this year. You have to think about what's going to happen in five years or 10 years. And that's a big guess, right? You just, we just don't know. But uh, what are you seeing big picture? Yeah, well, you, you hit the nail on the head. And I think as investors, it's, it's so important to be what I call macro aware, at least. And if you don't have to be an economist, but it's really important to understand what time we're in right now and what's going to work right now, right? And so our kind of tagline as a company is macro-driven alternative investments because for us, everything starts at the top first of understanding what's the big picture and then where are the opportunities that that big picture is going to create and then how do we identify the opportunities that are going to benefit from those those long-term trends in place? And, you know, we, we intuitively understand this as investors that, things go in cycles, right? And um, it's there's better times than others to be invested in certain areas at different times, right? And, you know, investing in uh, single family real estate in, you know, 2007, you know, not the best time, but investing in single family real estate in 2010, 11, 12, and beyond, like really good time to be investing in single family real estate. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, of a couple of years, you know, yeah. if you timed it right, you either lost money. Or if you timed it right, you made a ton of money. If you timed it wrong, you lost it. And that was just in a couple of years time. Just in a couple of years time. And there's, you know, did demand uh, 
completely drop off, you know, and then massively come back up in a matter of two years. No, it's the, the, the underlying dynamics, you know, changed a little bit, but the values, you know, changed a lot. And so one of the challenges is as investors, a lot of times you have to be somewhat contrarian, right? Because if you're mm-hmm. investing in the thing that everyone else knows is a good opportunity, that usually means you're pretty late in the cycle, right? And, uh, um, you know, the, the big shorts, a great, a great movie. If uh, you've not seen it, or love that movie, yeah. it, but you know, they, they kind of expose this, you know, where these people that should be buying houses and qualifying on no income and, um, you know, buying mansions and multiple houses, like that doesn't make sense. Right. But there, there's, there's better times than others. And so I think to answer the question broadly, as it impact, as it, uh, touches real estate is we've been saying for a while, uh, that, Inflation is going to be here to stay. We've been saying higher for longer for a while. Um, we think it's going to be very, very sticky. It's going to be very difficult to bring inflation to that 2% mark that the Fed wants to hit. Um, and you know, even when they were calling for all these rate cuts at the end of last year, this year at one point, I think they were expecting six you know, interest rate cuts in 2024. And now, you know, most people are saying maybe we get one or two at the end of the year and that's even shifted to some people are thinking we actually might see a rate hike, you know, depending on what happens. I mean, it's, it's a very quickly evolving narrative because a lot of, a lot of people, uh, or the natural human instinct is want to go back to what was normal, what was comfortable before. But, you know, in a lot of ways we feel like we might be entering a new era where we have higher inflation because, from our analysis, a lot of the issues that are keeping inflation higher are uh, systemic or structural, and they can't be changed all of a sudden, right? And the things that we think are driving a lot of that are, one, labor shortage. There's a huge worker shortage that we think is going to be a big issue to solve for a period of time, um, and that's largely driven by demographics. I don't think it's going to get any you know, uh, better for a while. And then the other other piece is energy, um, and this is a whole other conversation and discussion for why we are bullish on energy. But um, there's been a massive underinvestment in uh, fossil fuel exploration, and what that does is it uh, takes away from future supply because there's a long uh, s- a cycle from identifying and drilling to producing and then refining um, uh, fossil fuels, which are underlie a lot of our economy, right? Not just transportation, but uh, plastics and manufacturing. And it's, you know, if energy costs are high, it impacts every part of the economy because it's a trickle down effect. So because of that, we think there's a massive a structural supply shortage of energy that's going to uh, keep upward pressure on inflation. And so, you know, I could be wrong and I hope I'm wrong with inflation being higher for wrong, uh, longer, but if, if it is going to be higher for longer, that could really shift what uh, the Fed policy is for the long haul. And I, I think higher inflation requires higher interest rates to slow down that growth. And that's what we've seen. But a lot of people are expecting that just to go back to normal, let's go back to that, you know, three, four percent money. I don't I don't think that's the case, at least not any time in the short term. So from our perspective, we want to we want to build in the assumption that interest rates will be higher for longer. And we want to make strategic decisions, one, on all the assets that we currently are managing and managing through the cycle, but also on new acquisitions of what are our, our assumptions on you know, a refinance or a sale um, when we exit? And are we assuming the interest rates are going to be the same or even higher um, than they are right now? And I think um, that creates some conservatism, creates some buffer, but also I think there's a strong case to be made that that, that is the case. So no one likes to hear interest rates will be higher for longer, but I will say the caveat to that, and actually the reason that I'm actually very excited about real estate is the reason that interest rates would be higher for longer is if inflation is higher for longer. And if inflation is higher for longer, if you own real estate, that's a really, really good thing, especially in housing like, like you're in, because uh, real estate, and especially housing, um, is highly correlated to inflation. And so if inflation continues to be higher over time, on average, you know, income should be increasing and growing on those assets over time as well. And so even though maybe our debt service coverage is, uh, 
more expensive. Maybe our exit cap rates are a little bit higher because higher interest rates. If you can hold your assets, you can grow, grow through and effectively operate and manage assets over the next couple of years. As we come through kind of the cycle, uh, I think we're going to see those that were able to do that were rewarded with um, higher income than they even anticipated uh, a couple of years ago. And consequently, higher values, even if cap rates are uh, a little bit uh, suppressed. That should really be the mantra. Hold your assets. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, there's so much talk about flipping houses and wholesaling and, you know, all these things. But um, you're, you're missing out on so much of what you just said, which is this passive way of, you know, enjoying uh, values going up and increasing wealth. It's terrible. It's terrible for, um, for people who are not in assets. It just gets harder yeah. and harder yeah. every year. I agree with you that higher for longer. It, it, it's so funny how Wall Street got that wrong. You know, the, and remember in December, they're like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, we're going to get like eight rate cuts. And you know, like the market really reacted. And and you and I both being uh, contrarians were like, no, I don't. That's not what's happening. It's not getting cheaper. I kind of look at it like the the Fed doesn't really have a choice at this point mm -hmm. based on mistakes made from the past. They either have to find a way to pay off all the debt, you know, which is pretty much impossible or just continue to inflate. So there's deflate the economy, create recession and pop all bu bubbles. And uh, that would be bad. Uh, or continue to inflate that debt away. I mean, yep. right. They don't have a choice. hundred percent. No, you're exactly right. I mean, inflation, it benefits borrowers, right? It benefits borrowers because the future value of that money is, is higher and so you're paying your your debt off with more uh uh with you know higher inflation dollars and so it deflates the value of that that debt over time and you think about who's the largest borrower it's the US government so you're right i mean they have a they have an incentive to keep inflation a little higher for longer you know i think the the, the big question mark is can they keep selling um uh, you know, financing the deficits and selling bonds to the market. And there's obviously been a lot of softness recently on, on those auctions. And so that, that creates some other headwinds, right? Of how do they continue to finance these, these large deficits? And um, that, that I think still remains to be seen of what happens there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm with you. I think we're both out there trying to, warn people that, you know, if you don't get on the boat, you're going to be left behind. And it, it's terrible. It is creating a, a divide of the haves and the have nots. And there's not much we can do about it uh, at this point, I think. Yeah. 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 It's, it's important to understand and, and to get on the right side of the inflation, uh, inf the inflation curve here. Yeah. All right. Um, any, I, I know you guys aren't really investing in oil and gas right now, right? You, you've had funds in the past. Why is that? Uh, why don't we have the fund right now? I mean, we're, we're just actively deploying. So we're actually actively buying, but we raised all our money earlier, uh, this year. And so, okay. Uh, so it's not because oil and gas is not a good investment. It's just that you No, I, I think it's okay. an incredible, incredible investment. So I hope we can get this fund deployed ASAP so we can go do another one. Cause it's, <laughs> It's, I think, a generational buying opportunity right now. Um, not to get too much in the weeds, but we just bought an acquisition uh, uh, last week, and we purchased. These are producing wells, so these are these are large wells, horizontal wells. So they're operated by by large major operating companies. A lot of them are publicly traded. We we bought these off of uh, someone that needed the cash for something else, and they were willing to give us a sweet deal. We bought it at a 30% cap rate based on current prices. Oh my, wow. 30%. <laughs> and so that means unlevered cash on cash is 30% on producing wealth. So we're not taking any drilling risk and we're collecting, you know, the tax benefits on that, on that cash flow. Um, and it's, you know, proven uh, production. So it's, it's uh, from our standpoint, it's an incredible time to be buying because there's the, a lot of the capital in the market has left because of ESG, yeah, right. Uh, because of a lot of these um, kind of governance standards that are being imposed on large capital allocators, they have to hit certain green energy scores, and you know it's it's all well and good to a certain extent, but they are uh, they're disincentivizing 
capital allocating to fossil fuels, but all the t- the the goals and the benchmarks to hit a transition to a fully green economy are completely unrealistic in the timeframes that they're setting. And so uh, in a lot of ways, we believe we're shooting ourselves in a foot where in the foot where we're going to have um, a huge supply issue uh, down the road because um, uh, we're not investing right now to make, you know, make it through that transition period. So a supply think- issue as in lack of. La- lack of, lack and, of and like yeah. I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, it's very difficult to flip a switch and all of a sudden just turn on more production right. of oil, right, and gas because it's a long cycle of uh, exploration, uh, capital formation, development, drilling, uh, transportation, and re- refining down to the end consumer, and that's a multi-year, a very expensive process, mm-hmm. and uh, no one's drilling right now, uh, at least in a, in a broad way, right? In a, in yeah. A, compared to the past because of these disincentives. And so, um, we're, uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to see that. And we think it might be the early innings of an energy crisis in the U S over the next decade or so. So you're saying we should hold on to our land in North Dakota. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We bought at the wrong time, but you know, our mantra has been hold, hold, hold because it will come back. And, uh, yeah, I, I see that too. Uh, okay. Now, one thing I know this is, you know, we're, we're over time, but I just want to ask because someone pitched me on the oil and gas opportunity about a month ago when I was at another conference and kind of explained that you could buy these wells that, uh, don't have a lot of life left, but, you know, so the, the bigger groups are, you know, liquidating them, but they do run out at some point. Mm -hmm. And, I just thought that's interesting, you know. So, what happens if you buy the well? It runs out. I guess you're out of luck. Not you're much out of luck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this honestly should be a whole lot of conversation because there is a lot of uh, things that you need to be aware of. If you're going to invest in oil and gas. You need to. <laughs> you need to know what you're doing. <laughs> what you're investing and know what you're doing, and work with people who have good track records because it is a easy way to light money on fire. <clears throat> not not to mention there's Ponzi schemes and things out there. Oh and yeah. There's a huge one that just kind of went through the, you know, private equity market. They raised a quarter of a billion dollars. It was more of a of a tech play that, you know, captured um Oh, the capture one? The carbon capture. So it wasn't Car- a true Yeah, that was a that was a big Ponzi. Yeah. Big Ponzi. Um but no, but even in even in just actual legit opportunities, there's a lot of risk depending on where you're going and, and kind of sticking the fork in the in uh, the, the deal here. And if you're going like drilling, drilling is very risky. You know, there's infill drilling, which can be, um, you know, at a well-developed uh, geology, you know, it can be lower risk, but there's still a lot of uh, CapEx risk. Um, uh, it's very difficult to get the labor to drill right now, the equipment to drill. And then, yeah, old, old wells, vertical wells that have are you know long in the tooth. Um, you know, we own some of those assets, and it's not terrible, but it's it's you know it's always overpromised, always exaggerated on you know what they think they can do, what they'll pull out, and it's um, uh, at a, at a certain point, like you said, there's at a certain point some of these wells become uneconomical. They may still be producing, but the cost to get the oil actually isn't worth it to keep operating it, right? And so. Um, you know, you just, you gotta be careful when you're, when you're doing that because it's, uh, it's, it's a very, in a lot of ways, archaic industry still, a lot of the technology and the, and the vertical wells are still very much the same over the past 50 years. And so it's very mechanical. That's all about the geology. Um, and you know, on, on those types of wells, I think it's, uh, from what I've seen, it's generally, less production and more expensive to pull it out. And that obviously eats into potential returns. Um, and then just a broader, broader commentary. You're exactly right in that in oil and gas investing, it's very different from real estate because it is a depleting resource, mm-hmm. right? It's different than real estate, which is generally appreciating. It generally goes up in value with oil and gas. That's the reason why we're buying at such a high cap rate because eventually there won't be any oil or, or gas to pull out of the ground and the asset is not worth that much. But um, that that's why the production understanding how quickly you can get your capital back and mm. uh, what, you know, uh, yeah. cap rate you're buying at and the likelihood of that 
you know, uh, decline curve to, to stay where it's at and not massively you know, drop off. So it's important to understand some of those nuances and, you know, there's some great tax benefits in oil and gas, but don't let that be the tail that wags the dog, right? Cause it's never worth investing in something just for the tax benefits to end up with a capital loss and have a permanent, you know, tax. Yeah. Yeah. That was the pitch. Like, Hey, you're getting this incredible tax benefit. Uh, even though the thing's not going to be worth much in, in a few years. And I just thought, you know, I could get a great tax benefit in real estate and the thing is worth more in a few years. So I didn't right, get it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, Ben. Well, it's been so great to have you here on the Real Wealth Show I've, to have you back and talk more about these things. Cause I know that investors get pitched on it all the time and need to need to understand it better. So thank yeah, you for great. taking the time. Yes. Thanks for having me, Kathy. So fun. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. As I mentioned, I just got back from our San Antonio property tour. I got to see some of the duplexes out there that are being built and some of the fastest growing areas in San Antonio across the street from $500,000 homes, even $600,000 homes in some cases. Loved what I saw. The team there works with a local bank that can give four and a quarter percent interest rates to really up that cash flow. That loan is good for 10 years. It's pretty cool. Rich and I are definitely going to buy one of those. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can go to realwealthshow.com. Uh, just click on the invest tab. Once you join, it's free to join and you'll see the drop down for San Antonio, or you can just speak with one of our investment counselors there. Uh, San Antonio is one of the places that is going to be benefiting from all this activity of reshoring. So we're super excited about it. Plus, Austin nearby has gotten so expensive that a lot of the migration is moving a bit south. So exciting times. We should have another tour coming up. We'll probably do a syndication there as well soon because we looked at several parcels of land well, where we'll be doing build to rent in the near future. But uh, these four and a quarter percent interest rates, I don't know how long that'll last. So definitely check it out. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Well Show. We'll see you next time. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.